No, these aren't submarines. They were called whalebacks and were indigenous to the Great Lakes. When they were introduced in the latter half of the 19th century, they transformed how ships transported commodities. In the end, their distinctive design was one of the many factors that led to their demise. Before we get into the video, a quick word from today's sponsor, World of Warships. If you couldn't already tell, I love maritime history. I especially love recreating the ships that I talk about into 3D models. If you like 3D ship models just as much as I do, then you'll love World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game available for PC. Think of the game Battleship except with gorgeously detailed 3D models. You can take command of your own ship from the First and Second World Wars and battle against others on stunning lifelike maps. Plot a course to victory by strategizing with your teammates to sink enemies' warships and earn rewards. Do you have a favorite class of warships? Well, World of Warships has you covered. You can choose from over 500 ships and categories such as battleships, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and even submarines. Whether it be newly recreated ships or cosmetics, there's always something new being added to the game every month. Oh, did I also mention the game is available on consoles too. Immerse yourself into naval history by navigating to the link in the description below. Make sure to use the code WARSHIPS when you register to receive an exclusive reward including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a ship. You won't want to miss out on this incredible deal to experience naval history. Now let's get back into the history of whalebacks. Whalebacks were conceived by Captain Alexander McDougall in the 1880s. Originally from Scotland, he and his family had immigrated to Canada in 1854. At the age of 16, he ran away from home and took a job as a deckhand on the Great Lakes in July of 1861. He ascended the ranks and at the age of 25 became master of his own boat. During his time sailing on the Great Lakes, McDougall befriended Captain Thomas Wilson of Cleveland, Ohio. He ran his own ship line and, like McDougall, was a Scottish immigrant whom he looked up to. Wilson provided him with a variety of job opportunities and inspired him to start his own firm as a shipping agent and chandler in Duluth, Minnesota. In 1879, Wilson gave McDougall a job to oversee the construction of two new ships, the bulk freighter Hiawatha and the schooner Minnehaha. And before you ask, no, McDougall was not formally trained or educated in marine engineering and naval architecture. Although he wasn't directly involved with their design, his on-the-job experience would play an important role in developing his whalebacks. When both vessels were completed in 1880, he was appointed master of the Hiawatha. Over time, McDougall made an interesting observation while the Hiawatha was towing the Minnehaha. This common practice was called the consort system, whereby powered steamships pulled one or more tow barges, which were really just schooners. It maximized the amount of tonnage carried per trip, and tow barges required less crews, meaning more profit for company owners. Well, why not construct larger boats instead? Vessels on the Great Lakes during this time period were still being mainly built out of wood, as iron and steel hull boats were still in their infancy. Due to the limitations of using wood to build boats, canal sizes, and other factors, vessels could only be built so large. Notwithstanding these earlier mentioned benefits, McDougall found that there were a lot of drawbacks as well. The Minnehaha was difficult to handle when being towed, and it never maintained a straight path. Since steamers were never intended to tow barges, it was also considerably slower. In bad weather, barges were susceptible to sinking and would sometimes have to be cut loose from the steamer pulling them. McDougall was inspired by these observations to develop the whaleback. In March 1880, he quickly filed a patent for his invention, which he called a towboat. The hull of the vessel had an almost cylindrical shape, a flat bottom, and a spoon-shaped bow. Also, he had eliminated the ship's forward and aft shear, or bend, in favor of a straight line. Because of these design decisions, the whaleback design was not only less expensive to construct, but also simpler to mass produce. The other big thing was, instead of being wood or iron, McDougall was very early in the use of steel. He's among the earliest on the Great Lakes to use steel as a material for shipbuilding, mostly because it, un, until the 1880s, it was pretty expensive to make and not everybody really dealt with it. So most people worked with iron or wood because you're very familiar with that. It's a, it's a well-known commodity. Steel required new tools, new skill sets, new experiences. And so, and it's very, and it was initially very expensive 
When looking at a cross section of the hull, one great example of imagining a shape is an uppercase letter D with its flat part facing down. It was much different from other boats on the Great Lakes, which had rounded bottoms and straight tops. The purpose of this design was to allow the heavy seas and wind to pass over the rounded top, reducing surface resistance. This rounded top is, of course, how it got its whaleback nickname. When it was fully laden with cargo, it looked like a whale surfacing. Initially, McDougall intended for his tow barges to be unmanned while being towed in a straight line. However, he must have had second thoughts as in April 1882, he applied for another patent containing multiple revisions. He added two turrets positioned at the bow and stern to house equipment for the ship's anchor and mooring lines and a crew. The stern turret also had a place for the helmsman to steer. After building a model, McDougall was ready to build his first barge, number 101. He intended to show it to investors in order to raise funds for his vision of a fleet of whalebacks. To finance the construction of Barge 101, he, Thomas Wilson, and two of his business associates all purchased shares in it. Seven years after he first patented his design, the 101 was launched in Duluth, Minnesota on June 23, 1888. It measured 178 feet in length, 25 feet in beam, and 12 feet 7 inches in depth. The reception his boat got was underwhelming, to say the least. Most people thought it was odd-looking, and looked more like an elongated boiler than a boat. Several dubbed it a cigar-shaped boat, and others gave it the derogatory nickname of Pig Boat. It got this nickname because the two hawse pipes in the bow of the 101 looked like a pig's snout. On top of the harsh criticism his whaleback received, it had serious design flaws. So much so that McDougal had to hire Robert Clark, a marine draftsman, to help fix them. He found that the reason behind these flaws was that it was built in an unorthodox manner. Since McDougal himself was not a naval architect, he had no official blueprints for building 101. As a cost-saving measure, he used laborers unskilled in shipbuilding and chose a small shipyard in Duluth and capable of bending and shaping the steel for its bow and stern. To do all that rounded work, especially for the stern with a, with a rudder and everything's going to fit in, he had to subcontract it to a, a, a shipyard, Pusey and Jones, in Wilmington, Delaware. And they were experienced in building iron and steel ships, but they were primarily yacht builders. They wanted to innovate into new markets, so they said, sure, here's the problem. McDougall was not a naval architect, so he couldn't explain to you mathematically how it worked. He had a model, and so they built this model, and he sent the model to the shipyard. And the shipyard said, well, what's the, the camber and all this technical pieces? And I, I, I put money down. McDougall said, yes, and it didn't really didn't give him anything. And so one of the problems was, was that what Pusey and Jones did is they built the bow and the stern off of what this model, what information McDougal gave them. I'm sure they telegraphed back and forth. The problem was that they would have to take it apart. So it was called knockdown. Take it apart, load it on flat cars, send it to Luth, Minnesota, take it off the train car, haul it all the way down to the water, reassemble it like a giant rector set, and then attach it to the bow and the stern. The problem was they found that their measurements were off. So the bow and the stern were not the same size. I mean, it wasn't outlandish, but it's not. But in a ship, you, the rule of thumb doesn't work real well for something this big because the, the first whale back was not like a traditional ship. 101's maiden trip on July 5, 1888, carrying iron ore from Two Harbors, Minnesota, to Lorraine, Ohio was disastrous. It yawed wildly and smashed into a rock, damaging the bottom of its double hull. It even grounded multiple times along the way. After it discharged the iron ore at Lorraine, it had to undergo emergency dry dock repairs in Cleveland, Ohio on July 17th. While Robert Clark repaired and improved his design, McDougall began searching for investors. Fortunately for him, Venture capitalists from New York City, including Colgate Hoyt and brothers Charles and Joseph Colby, were looking to invest in the Lake Superior region's iron ore. Just in 1888, 5.1 million tons of iron ore had been shipped through the Sioux Locks in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. These three men began buying up mines and were looking for a way to haul this iron ore to the lower Great Lakes steel mills. McDougall put together a business proposal detailing his plans for a fleet of not only whaleback tow barges, but whaleback steamers pulling them. 
he saw this as a solution to their problem. His persistence paid off as on December 12, 1888, a contract was signed forming the American Steel Barge Company. Colgate Hoyt served as the organization's president and treasurer, and Charles W. Wetmore and Joseph Colby served as his first and second vice presidents respectively. In exchange for exclusive rights to use his patents, McDougall received a payment of $25,000 and was elected as general superintendent overseeing every whaleback's construction. With financial backing now settled, they immediately went to work launching four more whalebacks. American Steel Barge was not like conventional Great Lakes shipbuilding companies. They not only built the whalebacks, but they maintained and operated their entire fleet. In total, 44 whalebacks were constructed between 1889 and 1898. 23 of them were barges, and the remaining 21 were steamships. So now, let's take a look at the more noteworthy whalebacks and those with significant design changes. After Barge 101 was modified, it was also lengthened in 1889 from 178 to 191 feet. In continuing with the triple-digit number name, the barges that followed 101 in 1889 were 102 and 103. They received a broader bow and a tapered stern, which significantly improved steering. Both were also much larger than Barge 101, measuring 259 feet in length, 36 feet in beam, and 18 feet 8 inches in depth. Barges 104 and 105 further improved upon the design of 102 and 103 when they were launched in 1890. That same year also saw the first ever whaleback steamer produced, and the first whaleback with a name. Hall number 106 was christened the Colgate Hoyt and launched on June 9, 1890. It was 276 feet in length, 36 feet in beam, and 18 feet in depth. Now the Colgate Hoyt was a bit different than the whaleback barges, obviously. Unlike traditional boats on the Great Lakes, its pilot house and cabins were all located aft on three turrets. A spiral staircase was located inside one of these turrets, which provided access to the engine and boiler rooms. Each whaleback steamer only had one funnel that exited through its middle turret. The aftmost section of the hull also had small accommodations for the engine crew. An average whaleback crew consisted of about 22 men. By the time Barge 105 slid down the ways in 1890, it was the last whaleback to be launched in McDougall's Duluth shipyard. That was because the yard was inadequate for American steel barge to quickly turn out vessels. In addition to being too small, where only two vessels could be built at once, it was also in a flood-prone area, which added to the delays. McDougall and American Steel Barge executives started scouting potential new sites for the yard. They ultimately moved it to Howard's Pocket in West Superior, Wisconsin, across St. Louis Bay. This area contained mostly flat terrain and had investment property that was being offered for sale by the Land and River Improvement Company. Not only was it close to their current shipyard, but the company also gave manufacturers subsidies. West Superior was viewed by the Colby Hoyt Syndicate and Charles Wetmore as a perfect place to link with Washington State's City of Everett, a place that they established in 1890. They envisioned a throughway between both cities from Lake Superior to the Pacific Ocean via the Northern Pacific Railroad. The idea was, was that the Northern Pacific, uh, along with the Great Northern, are building these uh, twin train tracks across the northern part of the uh, Great Plains in the northern United States. And they hadn't really determined where they were going to end, uh, especially the Northern Pacific. And so the thought was, was that if you could uh, sort of have your city at the end of the railroad tracks, uh, you would be at the front end of uh, turning that area into a major port and really be catch lightning in a bottle on Puget Sound uh, in Washington and in, in what is relatively new Washington state. Remember, Washington state's only been not even a state for a decade. And it's pretty, pretty untapped. And what do you have these investors uh, doing, particularly um, for the, uh, the the Colgate family? Uh, Colgate Hoyt, uh, who is a uh, sort of a, what we would think of as a uh, entrepreneur and an, an inventor, not really an investor, we would call him almost like a venture capitalist. And Colgate Hoyt himself is a, a player. He's not the biggest player, but he's kind of a player. He knows John D. Rockefeller. He moves in those circles. And they go out and uh, and, the, and they really sort of want to uh, have with uh, 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 the Colbys as well, who are big railroad families, they want to sort of invest in a place out 
uh, on uh, the Pacific Northwest. And they connect with some of the folks uh, out there who are sort of looking for uh, that sort of opportunity too. Uh, Charles Wetmore, who is a, a really a lawyer, an investment lawyer, helps to direct a lot of money from Rockefeller into uh, this sort of a city. It's a city that really didn't exist until they really put that money in. They build a shipyard. They're going to have Pacific Steel Barge Company. And they begin to build a whaleback ship on the Pacific coast, the city of Everett. They send most of the uh, original materials for the nail factory, for the paper mill, for all this stuff, in another whaleback, the Charles W. Wetmore. When McDougall's new shipyard complex was completed in 1892, it had eight berths and extensive repair facilities. Allegedly in full operation, American Steel Bars could turn on a whale back every three months. That was due to American Steel Bars Executives West Superior Iron and Steel Company, which they established in 1890. It was near the source of their iron ore mines, and all the steel plates manufactured for the whalebacks could be easily hauled to McDougall's shipyard. Giant corporations like United States Steel, they didn't exist yet. So you had lots of little companies making steel. And these investors create West Superior Iron and Steel. They start a steel mill in Superior, Wisconsin. Today, the uh, train yards in Superior sit on, on the site. And the idea was, was they, would, they were like, we have a ready buyer of our steel plate product. The American Steel Barge Company by Alexander McDougall. Throughout the early 1890s, McDougall sought to show off his whalebacks to the world. As part of a publicity stunt in 1891, the whaleback steamer Charles W. Wetmore became the first whaleback to navigate outside of the Great Lakes. Nearly a month after its launch on June 11th, the Wetmore left West Superior, bound for Liverpool, England. She shot the rapids of the St. Lawrence River on June 22nd and loaded 90,000 bushels of wheat in Montreal the next day. On July 21st, the Wetmore arrived in Liverpool with great fanfare and curiosity attracting thousands of spectators. She returned to New York and Philadelphia after unloading her cargo, where she was then loaded with equipment and materials for Everett, Washington. Wetmore comes back, goes to Philadelphia, picks up all this equipment, goes all the way around the Cape Horn. There he is. There is no Panama Canal. They got to go all the way around South America, go all the way back up, and off the coast of California, the Wetmore loses her rudder. And they sort of stagger their way up to up to the Columbia River bar and they get helped out by a ship and get pulled in so they can fix it. It's a big pull, it's a big legal fight over that. But finally, she gets all the way up to uh Everett, Washington. And uh the Wetmore is the first whale back on the Pacific Northwest. She brings a lot of the equipment that will build the city of Everett. The Unfortunately, Charles Wetmore had a very short career. While carrying a load of coal from Tacoma, Washington to the Southern Pacific Railroad in San Francisco. The Wetmore encountered dense fog. As it was nearing the entrance of Coos Bay, Oregon, she ran aground on North Spit. Several salvage attempts were made to save the boat and its cargo, but bad weather ended all efforts five days later. As a result, the vessel and its cargo were declared total losses. McDougall saw another opportunity to gain publicity for his design in 1892. This time, however, he wanted to demonstrate his whalebacks could carry passengers just as well as cargo. The planning committee for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition was seeking bids from shipping companies to ferry passengers from Chicago to Jackson Park. The exclusive right to run to the fair was granted to American Steel Barge and four other companies. In the contract, American Steel Barge was to build and deliver a passenger whale back in three months. It needed to be capable of ferrying 5,000 day trip passengers and make 20 miles per hour. The Christopher Columbus, which was launched on December 3, 1892, was the first and only passenger whaleback ever built. It cost $325,000 to build and had the following dimensions, 362 feet in length, 42 feet in beam, and 24 feet in depth. The Columbus, unlike bulk carrier whalebacks, had seven turrets that supported two decks that extended nearly the whole length of the ship. These turrets had spiral staircases providing passengers with access to the main deck. As a product of the Gilded Age, its interior was lavishly decked out with mahogany and oak paneling, velvet carpeting, leather furniture, and marble countertops. It included a massive grand saloon, a 287-foot-long skylit promenade deck with restaurant and entertainment venues, and water fountains and aquariums. 
After several successful test runs, the Christopher Columbus was put into service on May 13, 1893. Over the course of the six-month fair, Columbus transported nearly 1.2 million people. It gained the distinction of ferrying more passengers than any other vessel on the Great Lakes, a title that it still holds to this day. After the fair ended, Columbus commenced regular runs between Chicago and Milwaukee. The Christopher Columbus remains one of the Great Lakes' most photographed vessels during the 1890s. Millions of people were introduced to the whaleback design by it and Charles Wetmore. 1893 was shaping up to be the best year for American steel barge. The Northern Pacific Railroad was nearing completion in the direction of Everett, Washington, and Pacific Steel Barge was preparing to launch its first whaleback steamer, the city of Everett. All of these plans, however, began to unravel quickly. The problem with Everett, Washington is they get everything all prettied up and ready to go, and the Depression of 1893 hits. And it's not a recession. It's a full-on depression, and it blows everything up. It is the Great Depression before the 1930s. Big impact. John D. Rockefeller finally asks the question that you would think he would ask was like, what's in my portfolio? And he finds out that he has some really good things. He, he ends up being a multi, he makes even more money off of the Minnesota iron mines. He also discovers he's invested in this place called Everett, Washington. And he goes, why am I doing this? Where's the logic in that? Because surprise, the Northern Pacific says, we're going to go to Seattle. We're not going to Everett. At the end of the day, the city of Everett, the whaleback built in the Pacific Northwest, uh, sits for almost a year uncompleted, just rusting away because they're out of it. And finally, the, the Rockefeller's sort of team goes, fine, build it and launch it. We don't want a ship sitting on the port. They launch the city of Everett. It takes off. There's a big parade. Um, but Everett sort of fades out for quite a long time, and it won't really until be um, after World War I that Everett begins to become a much more dynamic place. The onset of the Panic of 1893 marked the beginning of the end of not only McDougal's whalebacks, but the Colby Hoyt Syndicate's various operations. The ensuing depression decimated shipping traffic and the demand for new ships. As a result, the West Superior Iron and Steel Company closed, halting the construction of new whalebacks between mid-1893 and late 1895. Thousands of West Superior Iron and Steel and American Steel Barge Company employees were laid off, including the majority of McDougal's team. The Colby Hoyt Syndicate had invested millions of dollars from John D. Rockefeller's fortune into their operations in Everett and Superior. By June 1893, American Steel Barge had exhausted its cash reserves, and John D. Rockefeller had to mortgage $4 million of the company. Rockefeller, concerned about the extent of his losses in his investment portfolio, hired someone to audit his finances. John D. Rockefeller hires a, a, a Methodist minister who's in charge of his donations, uh, his charitable work, Frederick Gates. Gates describes himself as a killer gopher. You know, gophers go for this, go for that. He was a go for this, go for that, and get rid of it. What Gates does is just go, all this building in Superior, Wisconsin, and Everett, Washington, he goes, no, this is money losing. Yeah, American Steel Barge Company is okay. They're doing fine. But they, the problem is, is that Colgate Hoyt, Charles Wetmore, and Charles Colgy, Colby and Joseph Colby, they don't really have that kind of money to keep all this going. They're relying on John D. Rockefeller. And Gates goes, no way am I letting that money go into these losers. McDougal is very loyal and he sort of gets pulled into this power struggle and he doesn't want to throw Hoyt and Wetmore and Colby under the bus. Charles Colby dies conveniently, so he doesn't have to worry about it after a while. Um, but everybody else is sort of under the bus and McDougal, um, McDougal hates Gates. He really doesn't like him. And what Rockefeller does is they don't get rid of this. They keep the shipyard. They keep the mines. And what happens is, is that Gates is suspicious. He says, I don't know. These guys, even Hoyt and Wetmore, he keeps them around because they know where the bodies are buried. So he kind of starts pulling their levers. And what Gates does is he starts, this sounds really strange. He has a ship company to move all the iron ore, the American Steel Barge Company. But Gates says, mm, that's in-house. Is that really efficient? 
So he starts his own steamship company, the Bessemer Steamship Company. The Bessemer Steamship Company was of course named after Sir Henry Bessemer, the father of the Bessemer steel making process. Rockefeller wished to control every aspect of iron ore transportation from the Mesabi Range to the steel mills. He owned the majority of the mines as well as the Duluth Mesabi and Northern Railway, which transported the ore to the docks. He established his own steamship company to take the ore to the steel mills, and now he wanted complete control of American steel barge to build and repair a fleet of vessels for a steamship company. Rockefeller gradually forced the Colby Hoyt Syndicate out of the American Steel Barge Company due to mismanagement and poor bookkeeping. By February 1894, Rockefeller had acquired controlling interests in American Steel Barge. It was then consolidated under the Lake Superior Consolidated Mines Company Trust. As the effects of the panic began to recover, so did shipping traffic and the demand for new larger ships. One of those companies looking for new ships was Rockefeller's Bessemer Steamship Company. American Steel Bars was chosen as one of six shipbuilders to build two vessels each for Rockefeller. They had to be at least 400 feet long, which proved difficult for Alexander McDougall. McDougall would test the waters for larger whalebacks before fulfilling Rockefeller's order by building a steamship and barge consort for American Steel Barge. Launched on April 25, 1896, the steamer Frank Rockefeller was 366 feet in length, 45 feet in beam, and 26 feet in depth. Take note of how his pilot house and captain's cabin were separated from the rest of his aft superstructure. Fourteen days later on May 9th, the 345-foot-long barge number 137 was launched. The first vessel from Rockefeller's order slid down the ways on July 11th, 1896. Christened as the John Erickson, this whaleback steamer was a record 390 feet in length. Rockefeller wanted the Bessemer's ore carriers to all share a similar profile. Being that whalebacks were so much different from a conventional lake vessel, there was only so much McDougall could do. As a result, one of the similar design choices was to position the Ericsson's pilot house forward behind his first cargo hatch. McDougall's final vessel for Rockefeller was the Alexander Holly, a 382-foot-long barge launched on August 12, 1896. No further whalebacks were built for the rest of 1896 or in 1897. However, American Steel Barge did construct one vessel in 1897. It was, however, a regular barge called the Constitution. If you haven't already guessed, the end of the whalebacks is near. In 1898, McDougall would construct his final whaleback, appropriately named Alexander McDougall. On June 25th, the boat was christened by his daughter Emmeline and slid down the ways. The Alexander McDougall was the largest whaleback ever built, measuring 413 feet long, 50 foot in beam, and had a depth of 22 feet. It was also the only whaleback with a quadruple expansion steam engine and a conventional bow. Despite years of widespread exposure and the success of whalebacks, the design was never widely adopted. So what was the reason for this? Let's look at the various factors that contributed to their demise. Whalebacks have a built-in problem. And this is the sh short thing. Uh, to, in order to hold the outside of the ship and, and put cargo inside, you need a lot of support. So like inside of a house, you, know, you need studs and braces to hold the wall out and stuff. Well, the problem is the further you get along in, in the bow, the more of them you need to hold the ship apart, which means you've got dead space inside the ship, which means you can't haul much cargo. So what they do is, is, is the whalebacks are limited in size. And so that's a fundamental problem. And they, they just, it's, it becomes more expensive. They go from being relatively cheap to build to where now steel ships have progressed and gotten bigger and bigger and bigger to where now it's much easier to build. So they don't want to do that either. So at the end of the day, what McDougal, what ends up in is that they also have a problem to where by 1898, there's a new technology to unload ships called a Hewlett ore unloader. It's a big hunk of equipment. The wheelbacks have fairly small hatch covers and they are flush. They're like flush to the deck. A piece of steel with a gasket would fit out of it and you'd screw it down. Well, that's really hard to get off. And if you hit the edge of it with this big clunky machine thing, they leak. And in a ship that has, you know, four feet of freeboard and waves are supposed to wash over it, you got leaky hatches, you can see how that's going to end up. That doesn't go well. So you've got a two-part problem. The Hewlett ore unloader, I would put, point out, makes every ship on the Great Lakes immediately obsolete. And they're going to have to deal with it. Um, the other thing is the size of steel ships, conventional ships, spans dramatically. In fact, the last wheelback will have a conventional bow. 
and an effort to try to extend the design. But once you have a conventional bow on this rounded deck, what's the point? And they could get much wider. And the, and the wider they got, the harder it was to build. So the wheel back, its early lead sort of goes away very quickly. And the two-part problem, the hatches, the size, and they're also building steel ships in Superior, Wisconsin, where you've got to haul everything up there. Your steel mill is now shut down. You've lost your competitive advantage pretty dramatically. Despite the fact that Hewlett unloaders and conventional steel ships rendered whalebacks obsolete, they remained on the Great Lakes for many decades. Many of them were converted into oil tankers, sand dredges, and even automobile carriers. One whaleback, the SS Clifton, formerly known as the Samuel Mather, was retrofitted as a self-unloader to carry stone. Not long after its conversion in 1924, the Clifton sank during a Lake Huron September storm. Its wreck was located in 2016 and was found that its self-unloading equipment probably made the vessel top-heavy, which caused it to sink. Today, there is only one surviving whaleback, which is the SS Meteor, formerly named Frank Rockefeller. It was retired in 1969 and made into a museum ship in 1971. It is located in Superior, Wisconsin, not far from where she was built. As for the American Steel Barge Company, it was merged into United States Steel in 1901 along with Rockefeller's other holdings. As a result of the merger, Alexander McDougall's position was eliminated and his whaleback patents no longer belonged to him. The company's shipyard in West Superior would continue to operate, building and repairing conventional ships. A portion of the yard is still used today by the Fraser Shipyard, which repairs modern-day lake boats.